All right, so we are in infective endothelium. Please volunteer the giving me the chain of infection. What are those links in the chain of infection? The host. What are the six links in the chain? Because this is an infectious uh, condition. So we have to review what is the concept of infection. The host. Okay, we have a susceptible host. What else? Um, the entry. Port the entry entry. exit. The okay. reservoir. Um, Not a a way of transmission. No, go on. And the um, agent. Agent exit. Ex okay, so the. Can you see the, the whiteboard? Can you uh, see the whiteboard or no? No. no. The whiteboard in progress. Can you see it or no? No. No, it still says in progress. No. Can you see it now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you guys said there's a host and there's a causative organism and then there's a reservoir and then there's a portal of exit. Uh, and the portal of this should be entry. This should be entry. The exit is, and then this is the mode of transmission, right? And then we have the portal of exit. All right, so we have the chain. So the organism here in infective endocarditis it, this could be anything this could be uh, bacterium viral could be protozoan could be um, parasite okay any organism most common though for infective endocarditis are streptococcus and staphylococcus so this is the same strep organism causing the strep strep throat so it's not a it's not having strep throat is not something that you can just ignore you have to address strep throat because if you don't treat it it could potentially enter the bloodstream and now you it could infect your heart this is this condition was quite common in the 1950s 60s because people didn't really we didn't know that much about streptococcus we thought uh, you know, we can just drown it with alcohol, with uh, vodka, for instance, or a lot of bourbon, and then that, that takes care of it. Um, it's not. This, uh, the, the condition, once it hits the heart, it can damage the valve and goes. the patient goes into heart failure because now they have a valve problem. Another portal of entry is the 
mouth. Most commonly, the mouth. That will include the dental procedures or any other oral surgery. As far as dental procedures go, it doesn't really matter if we're just doing cleaning or doing root canal. Uh, if you guys recall, uh, Israel, the last time you had your teeth cleaned, was it bloody? No. Is there blood involved? Meaning not even a drop of blood when they were cleaning your teeth? nothing that you could really see like that like they weren't extremely rough i mean sometimes like if the uh bristle part touched my gum it'll probably like cut a little bit okay and can you say that your mouth is clean uh yeah no don't they say like the mouth is like one of the dirtiest things yeah like, compare you know, your mouth and your rectum which one is dirtier <laughs> I would Which like to mouth. say rectum, but I think science would say mouth. Yes, that's true. So the mouth, uh, it, that end of the GI tract is actually dirtier compared to the other end. The other end, of course, it smells bad um, just because there's um, waste products there. Uh, however, as far as organisms go, there are actually multiple more organisms found in the mouth than in the rectum. So the mouth is a big portal of entry for infective endocarditis. It's usually, it can come from most patients who get this have either a, a tooth abscess or they had a recent dental procedure done. Uh, so that's how it uh, enters the body. And how does it enter the, uh, the, the host here? We have a variety of uh, susceptible hosts. One is the, the ones we already discussed, those who underwent dental or oral surgery. Others are IV drug users. Uh, others are uh, who have IV lines, particularly central lines. Um, also immunocompromised people. So we have several portals of entry here and susceptible hosts. We have the mouth. Um, used to be they also included respiratory and GI, uh, you know, lower GI or even genital urinary when you get a cystoscopy, for instance. Uh, those invasive procedures, they included it, but the American Heart Association eliminated them as the risk factor. They only said particularly the mouth now. A dental or oral surgery is high risk for infective endocarditis. And then, of course, these people right here, IV drug users, they have IV lines, they have uh, an immunocompromised immune system, uh, a compromised immune system. So these are the high risk people that can get infective, uh, that can get endocarditis. These are non, um, not really old people. Uh, most people who get endocarditis are young. However, question to you is, why would it most commonly affecting the mitral and the aortic valve? Why these two valves? Why not the tricuspid and the pulmonic valve? Miss Donna. Why do you think it's always the mitral or the aortic valve? Can you repeat that for me, Professor? Why does it commonly affect it? Uh, why do, does it commonly affect mitral or the aortic valves? I'll help you out. What do you need? If you were a bacterium, Miss Medisa, if you were a bacterium, what would you need to live and reproduce? 
if you're a bacteria, you need, um, like, to feed off of something. So oxygen and... All right. What else? I don't know. Maybe, like, sugar. <laughs> All right. So we need oxygen and sugar. So bacteria are just like us. They need oxygen. They need sugar in order to survive. <clears throat> Um, where would you find the best source of oxygen and the most sugar between the right side and the left side of the heart? Where would you find that? Um, coming from the lungs, you'll find the most oxygen. So which side? That would be the left side. Okay, the left back. side. And the mitral valve and the aortic valves are found on the left side, correct? So the bacteria are smart. They would go to the place where they get the best oxygen. In fact, they'll be the first ones to get oxygen because this blood entering the left atrium and into the from the lungs. So this blood is highly oxygenated. Before the rest of the body gets it, they get first dibs. So they would live in the mitral or aortic valve. So they would make houses there. They would make, they would create what's called vegetation because of course your white blood cells will start attacking these the moment they appear there. However, the, the, the remnants of the battle between the, your immune system, your white blood cells and these will form vegetations. The vegetations are, um, they, they're solid material. So it, it's the best way I can describe it is, you know how plaque forms in our teeth, you know, the white stuff that forms in the cracks of the teeth between, between each tooth and also around the gum line. You know, that, that material that our dental hygienist removes every time we go for cleaning. Yeah, plaque. You, wanna, you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Okay, so the vegetations form something like that. So they're not really permanent structures. They're structures created by the, the bacterium and the battle, you know, the remnants of the battle between the white blood cells and the bacteria. What's formed is called vegetation. Now, imagine if you were inside the left side of the heart. Is it peaceful in there? Is it a tranquil, peaceful place? No, there's a lot going on. All right, so it, that thing beats 60 to 100 times a minute. That valve opens and closes 60 to 100 times a minute. So it's not very peaceful. So will the vegetation stay put? Or will they eventually break off and become emboli? Yeah, they'll eventually break off. They'll break off. Emboli. Yeah, they'll, they're, because they're not really strong structures. They, they, the bacteria make them there, you know, as a place to live. You know, they, they, they form those. But then they don't stay forever. Some of them, pieces of it break off, and then now you have emboli circulating in the bloodstream. And those can cause problems. They can obstruct small blood vessels, which we'll get into uh, later. So these are again your risk factors. We, we mentioned them already. Also, having a damaged valve increases your risk. So if you had an existing valve problem and then you were you developed endocarditis, your risk goes higher. Meaning the fact that you had a damaged valve puts you at higher risk for infective endocarditis. And so therefore having one in the past makes you at another risk for another one in the future. Okay, so you may start with or without a valve problem, but once you develop endocarditis, it will damage your heart valve. It will damage one or more depending on where they form those vegetations. And then after that, because now you have a damaged valve or a history of a damaged valve, now you will be at risk for another one. So from then on, if you have the, um, the, the risk factor, you will be given prophylactic antibiotics before any dental procedure or any oral surgery. 
So here's the risk for IE. Um, so you just add all these together. So let's say you have a patient on dialysis going for a dental procedure or a diabetic going for a dental procedure. They are at even more higher risk because they have multiple risk factors now for the development. So therefore, a standard practice, the dentist will give you or your doctor will give you prophylactic antibiotics before you go for the dental procedure. You will be put on prophylactic antibiotics, maybe seven or 10 days, uh, just for prophylaxis. Okay. Um, if you have been to the dentist recently, especially if you went to a new dentist, part of the paperwork you filled out unless you forgot already one of the questions on the on the new paperwork is have you had a history of a bowel problem or have you had endocarditis in the past this is these are standard questions your dentist your dental office will ask you on the on the sheet when you when you become a new patient all right so because they already are aware of endocarditis So I talked about the, the vegetation, right? So these are, um, these are what happens. So we, we talked about the vegetation. So the vegetation here can damage the heart valve. And as a result, now you could develop heart failure as a result. These are the two most common causative organisms, strep and staph. And these are how they form vegetations in the valve. So it could be, it's usually the mitral valve for obvious reasons. Again, the left side is rich in oxygen. So bacteria are smart. They would go to that place because it's the rich, it contains the richest oxygen. That or the aortic valve. Between these though, the aorta has higher, will withstand higher pressure. So they typically don't like to to grow there because the pressures are so high. So between the aorta, uh, aortic valve and the mitral, they would stick with the mitral. Let's go to how do we know? The patient, of course, has an infection. So they'll have non-specific signs and symptoms of, an inf of a systemic infection. So they'll have fever, malaise, body aches, um, you know, no, uh, no appetite. No, they feel, they feel sick. Okay, just like you guys when you when you have a systemic infection, you feel lousy. So that's how the patient presents. However, there are some uh, symptoms specific to endocarditis. These are not found anywhere else. So we'll see Osler's nodes as well as Janeway's lesions. The description are here. So they are uh, painless spots. They are macula, you know, like red spots. Um, painless spots on your palms and also on the soles of your feet. So these are called Osler's nodes or Janeway's lesions because okay, they can also occur in your fingers. Um, these are specific to an infective endocarditis. It's almost non-existent in any other disease condition. So when these appear, it's highly suspicious for infective endocarditis. Now what causes these? These are actually microscopic uh, capillaries that burst open. Uh, these are now the emboli that I talked to you about earlier. So those vegetative emboli uh, that broke off from the from the vegetation end up in small areas like exactly the you know the peripheral parts of your of your body the the fingers the hands and also the feet they end up there and that's how these Osler's nodes and Janeway's lesions form and like I already said the patient feels sick and they look sick um, plus the clinic clinician will also find a change or a new murmur meaning if you've never had a murmur before, now you have one. The murmur, of course, we know what causes the murmur sound. How does one develop a murmur? What happened to the heart? Why can't you hear lub dub anymore? Why not? Why not S1, S2? Why S1 and then a murmur? The valve doesn't close properly. 
All right, so now once you damage the valve, it doesn't shut anymore because you already damaged it. It will no longer shut close. So therefore, it can't close. You'll have a leak with every heartbeat and that produces the murmur sound. So either you have no murmur before, now you have one, or if you had a murmur before, that murmur now sounds different. Okay, so there's either a new or a change in an existing murmur sound. And these are the other symptoms. So confusion is common in the elderly when they get an infection. Okay, so how do we make a diagnosis? The doctor will order blood cultures and then whichever organism grows in the culture, then that's the causative organism. Then they make a diagnosis. To support the diagnosis, they have to do a, uh, an echo. The best echo is a TEE uh, versus a TTE. A TTE is when the probe the, uh, the echocardiogram or looks like an ultrasound probe is just rubbed over the surface of your chest wall. Whereas a TEE, the probe is shoved down your throat into your esophagus, giving you a closer look into the heart. So between a TEE and a TEE, the picture is better in a TEE. Now, why do they do this? No, they need to see how much damage the endocarditis has done to the valve because the doctor needs to know whether or not the patient needs surgery to repair or replace the valve. Medications, so we have two problems here. We have an infection, we have an active infection, as well as now the patient has a valve problem causing heart failure. So will this patient receive heart failure medications? Yes, so the patient will receive the duab, then you know, from the doables. So they'll be on uh, diuretics, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, um, digoxin if this becomes chronic, uh, low salt diet, etc. Now, if the patient, since the patient also has an infection, they will be given antibiotics. Now, this is not. Um, a regular infection. So this is major because it now affected the heart. So the antibiotic therapy here will be long term. It'll be given four to six weeks. And because it's IV, therefore you need a central line. So remember, the central line was one of the risk factors for getting the infection. So your, your goal here is, of course, to prevent another one because now the patient has another portal of entry. This time the the central line. It could be a PIC line, a, uh, a non-tunneled catheter, or a tunneled uh, catheter. All right. The oral here are usually for the um, prophylactic dose. Remember, we need to give also prophylactic antibiotics if this patient goes for dental procedure or any other oral um, procedures. But to treat infective endocarditis, you need IV antibiotics. And again, it's four to six weeks. The, these are the common antibiotics that will be ordered to treat strep or staph infection. Now, uh, take note that uh, this is, um, this patient should not stay in the hospital. However, this won't be what you see in the city hospital. In city hospitals, they tend to keep the patient in the hospital for the entire four to six weeks, uh, which is uh, really, if you look at it, it's a waste of money because the patient is only receiving IV antibiotics. They're otherwise stable. The reason for that is look at the risk factors again. Who, what, what types of people get infective endocarditis again? back here under risk factors. Who are these people again? They are? Strep 2 and... IV drug users, right? Oh, okay, so most common are IV drug users. They would represent over half of the patients that are admitted in the hospital. 
uh, most mostly um, IV drug users, or some of these patients may have a wound because um, it, it can also be another portal of entry. Say the patient has a boil, for instance, an abscess somewhere else besides the mouth, let's say in the perineal area, for instance, or any other, you know, so usually these patients are either IV drug users or maybe homeless. So that's why the patients you see in the city hospitals, those are the patients that we have there that stay the entire four to six weeks because they have nowhere to go. Plus, it's not really safe to send them uh, home with a central line because you know what they'll do with a central line, right? What What do you think an, an IV drug user will do if they have a central line? Put drugs in there. Yeah, they'll be, you know, they'll be so happy. Say, oh, thank you. I don't have to stick myself. Thank you so much. This is going out to complications. So I already mentioned the heart failure. Um, the other uh, complications are in the embolization. So these are the danger. It's just a matter of, it's okay if they just end up in the hands or in the feet, but they can potentially end up in abdominal organs as well or even in your brain so they can cause problems in the GI tract in the kidneys or in the brain like I said okay and your patient may end up with a with a stroke or they may have uh, the E. coli are not really big they're so tiny but doesn't mean they won't cause uh, obstruction. So they'll, they, they'll come to somewhere wherein they'll be small and or uh, big enough to cause a problem. And that's exactly what will happen here. So in the GI tract, in the kidneys, or even in your brain, or in the, in the lung. Uh, let's go now to nursing care. Now we, we know the signs and symptoms. Let's go for the monitoring and evaluation. In interventions, it's usually the uh, IV antibiotics, and of course, you give the patient uh, medication also for heart failure. Uh, the surgery here is uh, valve repair, which we already discussed under uh, valve disorders in module, was it module one, where we did heart failure and valve problems? Yeah, module one. Yeah. And we already discussed between mechanical valve and biologic valves, right? You remember that? So let's review which uh, patients will receive anticoagulation. Is it the people who received a mechanical or a biologic valve? I think we did that. Hello? Yeah, does anyone remember? No, I don't think we did that. Okay. Well, so if a patient... Is, sorry, just, what was it? We just like went over the signs and symptoms of all failure, what medication we would give. We okay, so let's discuss it now. So under surgery, if a patient is... If the patient's valves are beyond repair, now it needs to be re replaced. Now, there are two options here. There's a biologic valve and there's also a mechanical valve. Biologic valves, they're from pigs or cows or from a human cadaver. The benefits are they don't typically attract blood clots because they're from organic material. Okay, so they're from living organisms. So they don't tend to form blood clots. However, because they are from living tissue, they don't last very long. They may, they have a typical um, guarantee of about 10 years. After 10 years, they need to be replaced. Mechanical valves, on the other hand, are made of metal. So different metals, you know, you have titanium, stainless steel. So they tend to last forever. However, because they are not organic material, they are foreign objects, they tend to attract blood clots. They 
tend to attract platelets. So if a patient receives mechanical valve replacement, they will have to be put on anticoagulants, which is only warfarin. We cannot use any other anticoagulant because this is a heart valve. The, the, the novel anticoagulants, the, you know, Pradaxa, Eliquis, those you see in, uh, in clinical, those that don't require routine blood monitoring, unlike warfarin or Coumadin, um, you can't use them because this is a valve problem. So they don't work. So only warfarin will be given to these patients who receive mechanical valves. Any question on the surgery? All right, so let's continue here. We were at, all right, so of course, part of your teaching will be, uh, remember the um, long-term antibiotic, okay? Say so they have to finish it um, because there are instances wherein the patient will be, if the case manager, that's you also, <clears throat> you can work as a case manager after your assessment. Oh, it's safe to send this patient home. Uh, it's it's fine. They, we can send them home, and then send a um, <clears throat> home health nurse to administer the IV antibiotics. Or even better, if you can teach and train somebody, because Medicare Medicaid um, will uh, have guidelines that if you have someone you can train and teach to give the IV antibiotic, they'd prefer that. So the nurse will also be training either the the spouse or any other family member or if it's the patient because we've had patients i've had one patient who was an rn um she just got into trouble you know she she went into iv drug use so she lost her license but she is a nurse so she's capable so um so she knew how to do it we just gave her uh, an extra long extension because of course she, she basically um can't use her affected arm where the pick line is. So we, we just made a uh, an extra long extension tubing so she can handle it with both hands. So that's what we do. So we um, send the patient home if safe and available. there's someone available. If not, then we'll send uh, a nurse at home to give the antibiotics every day for four to six weeks. It's way cheaper than putting the patient in the hospital. The hospital bed will cost you at least about $1,300 a day. Uh, compare that to the home, you'll only pay the nurse, I don't know, one visit for IV antibiotics, maybe 100 bucks. So they can save a lot of money. That uh, Plus that's six weeks, right? So the Medicare, Medicaid can save a lot of money. And that also applies for private insurance as well. So this is a no-brainer. If a patient is IV drug user, then uh, refer them for treatment. This is now your, remember this patient um, had a endocarditis already, so they have a higher risk now of getting it again. So here are the good oral hygiene, plus we uh, tell them for prophylactic antibiotics, which we already knew. Um, for evaluation purposes, remember the patient will have six weeks, right? Four to six weeks. So we can't wait till the end of the four or six weeks antibiotics before we can monitor progress. We have to see, is the patient responding well? Is the organism being killed by the antibiotics we are using? So once a week, we will draw inflammatory markers uh, however, blood culture will only be done at the end of the therapy. So at the end of the therapy, we draw blood cultures. If it's clear, then we have cured it. What happens to the heart failure or the valve problem? Will that disappear at the end of the antibiotic therapy? No. No, the damage has already been done. Been done. So the patient now, uh, unless we... Uh, repaired it, they will have a permanently damaged valve. And therefore, the, the murmur will not disappear because you have a damaged valve unless it was repaired or replaced. 
Uh, but remember, heart failure is there a cure for heart failure once you develop heart failure? No. No. Except, of course, if you get a heart transplant, that's it. Any question on endocarditis? All right, let's move on to pericarditis and then we'll have a break. Pericarditis, this is now the, unlike endocarditis, wherein it was the endocardium, it was the inner lining of the heart, inside the heart itself that was infected. This one, it is the pericardium, or this is the sac around the heart. So this is the, um, the connective tissue covering the heart with a small amount of lubrication there. So we have pericardial fluid, which is uh, maybe only 5, 10 ml uh, necessary for lubrication. So as the heart keeps beating, uh, there is no friction between the pericardium and the myocardium. Okay. So what are the causes here? There are still infectious causes, meaning the same bacteria, fungus, viral, parasites, still the same. However, there are other non-infectious causes. One is from an MI. If the patient develops pericarditis within the first 24 to 48 hours of an, a heart attack, the patient develops acute pericarditis. However, if the pericarditis occurs weeks later, let's say several weeks, they're already at home, and then they develop pericarditis, it's still pericarditis, but it's now called Dressler syndrome. It's spelled D-R, like dress, you know, like your dress, D-R-E-S-S, -S, and then L-E-R, Dressler syndrome. It is now called Dressler syndrome if it occurs later, weeks later after the MI, but it's the same pericarditis. And there are other causes that, um, the other cause is lupus. Um, do you, have you heard or know someone who has lupus? Yeah. Okay, so there are four causes here. One is infectious, you know, the bacteria, any organism can cause pericarditis, the same entry as we uh, discussed in endocarditis. The second one is acute pericarditis after an MI or it could be weeks later after an MI, which is now Dressler syndrome. And then number four is lupus. Lupus affects all connective tissue um, and pericardium is a connective tissue. So it's also affected. So when a patient with lupus gets an exacerbation, this could potentially be one of those complications from the flare up of uh, a lupus. Others, of course, we there are there is no body system not containing connective tissue. So we're talking about the lungs will also be affected. The GI tract will also be affected. The brain, the kidneys, the joints. Okay, so all parts of your body that has connective tissue will be affected during a lupus flare up. So that's why your number one goal in lupus is to keep them in remission. You don't want any exacerbation. So here, oh, I correct myself. There is more fluid there in the pericardium. It's actually 15 to 50 ml. So that's the fluid inside that space, inside the sac okay, of the pericardium. This will, again, the purpose of this fluid. This is, uh, by the way, constantly produced and drained. Okay, so your pericardium uh, constantly produces this and this, it's also constantly drained. You know, the purpose again is to lubricate the heart. What are the patient's complaints when they develop this? Number one is pain. The pain is from this friction rub. Because imagine you uh, ladies, for instance, uh, Sheila. You still party, Sheila? Maybe not lately, but yes, uh, yes, a lot, but not lately. Since January, right, I haven't but, been. Yeah, before COVID, right? Party, right? Yes. So 
do you have time to break in your brand new heels when you go to party when you can get on that bar ledge no. when you go dancing there and the pole you know you, no, you i don't do the pole but my my heels do break in okay so you no no time to break in new heels right it's no. friday night no we just bought it ah and it, we can't wear it during the week because we're in school so when you were dancing there with the new heels, which you haven't bre broken in yet, um, what will form in your heel from all that twisting and turning? When you have those brand new six inch heels and then uh, dancing in them, what will you form in your heels? Some of them are holes. Some of them are holes. Some of them, you know, like dust like they scratch up. But you you do you form blisters. A they erode. They erode. And right. calluses. Yeah. Okay, so you get blisters, and then over time, yeah, calluses. All right. So the blister there that form, it will be the same here because imagine, can the heart stop beating? Like Sheila will probably stop dancing because the her heels now hurt. Okay. Does the heart does the heart have that option? Because it, it's painful. Can the heart stop beating for now? Because the pericardium is so inflamed. No. The heart do, No, the heart doesn't have that option. It will continue to beat. And then the continuous beating and beating against this already very inflamed sac around it. What will form inside that sac? Just like Sheila's heels. What did Sheila form in her heels? Blisters. A blister. So what will form inside the pericardium? Blister. Blisters as well. So this is why I explain the new or worsening pericardial effusion. If the amount of fluid here, which we talked about earlier, was 15 to 50 ml, if that increases, that is now called pericardial effusion. Because imagine you have the heart inside a sac. So imagine putting your heart inside a balloon and then put fluid, put water in that balloon where your heart is located. And then you add more and more water in there. What will happen to the contractility of the heart and as well as the pressure inside and around the heart? Will that maintain perfusion? Will that maintain cardiac output? No, not efficiently. No. First of all, venous return will be decreased because now there's a lot of pressure in and around the heart. It'll be impossible for blood to normally enter and exit the heart. So your, your circulation here will be affected. Cardiac uh, output suffers. Patient will go into hypotension. Okay. Um, the other symptoms here are related to the, uh, especially these three here. These are now signs of decreased cardiac output. The fever, of course, is from the infection or the inflammation of the pericardium. The orthopnea is now a symptom of decreased cardiac output. Diaphoresis is from, because what will be automatically stimulated once cardiac output drops? what hormone will be released? Epinephrine, epinephrine, right? Okay, epinephrine will be released, increasing heart rate and causing vasoconstriction, causing you to sweat like a pig. Okay, sweat cold, you become cold and sweaty because of the low cardiac output. And on x-ray or ultrasound, you'll see the doctor will see the effusion. If the patient's cardiac output is severely affected, the doctor has to drain that fluid. The patient will complain of the chest pain, as already mentioned earlier, because, of course, it's, it's painful. The heart will beat against that really inflamed um, pericardium, and you'll see ECG changes. There will be uh, signs of ischemia, and uh, whenever there's ischemia, ST segment always rises. Okay, management. So first of all, uh, patient of course complains of pain, so you give the patient um, 
NSAIDs. NSAIDs are ordered here because it's the pain is from the inflammation, from the inflamed pericardium. So NSAIDs will work very well for this type of pain, not opioids. Uh, diagnostic tests will, of course, be you, you do a TEE just like um, pericarditis, and then we can do CAT scan also to see if there's any pericardial effusion that formed and how bad it is. So here is the pericardial effusion. If that fluid buildup again is greater than 50 ml, that may need to be drained now to maintain cardiac output. So imagine this is now the picture. So it's like a really a, a rubber balloon. You put your heart in there and then imagine that fluid, I mean that balloon filled with water like this. Okay, so there's a lot of pericardial fluid there. Uh, here is a, um, because a pericardial friction rub and a pleural friction rub, because uh, the pleura can also get inflamed, um, they they sound the same when you when you listen to it to over the heart. Pericardial friction rub and pleural friction rub sound the same. Okay, so there will be a a scratching, grating sound like crack, 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 like that when you when you listen to the heart. Um, the best way to um, distinguish between pleural and pericardial is, of course, you ask the patient to hold the breath. If they hold the breath, the sound disappears, then it, it's pleural friction rub. If they hold the breath, the sound is still there because you can't really hold your heart, right? You can't stop your heart from beating. So if the, if the sound continues, then it's pericardial friction rub. Here, because of the fluid accumulation, though, they will hear, they will sound muffled muffled or distant just like when you have a mask on and you talk that's how the the heart sounds will will um uh will sound like to you uh why is that why does the heart sound uh, s1 s2 sound very far or muffled because there's a lot of fluid between your stethoscope and the heart so therefore the heart sounds now are diminished or they sound very far they sound very distant and this is the pericardial friction rub it's a high-pitched scratchy noise as already described um, because it's an inflammation just like endocarditis there will be an increase in your crp and your esr so it's not really going to definitively diagnose because uh, pericarditis because it's also present in any other infection or inflammatory condition. Uh, I already mentioned NSAIDs for pain. Um, I haven't seen them give aspirin. It's usually ibuprofen. Uh, other treatments are steroids. However, if um, steroids will be used, especially if the cause of the pericarditis is lupus, because of course lupus is autoimmune disorder, you give steroids and that will suppress the uh, hyperactive uh, autoimmune disease. Um, however, if it's bacterial, they will not, of course, give steroids because what will happen if you give a patient steroids if they have a bacterial infection? Wouldn't it like lower the chance of fighting it because it would all... all right? So the patient won't have the ability to fight the infection anymore because you're giving them steroids. So again, for pericarditis. Uh, the treatment will also vary with the cost. So if it's infectious, then you treat them with antibiotics, antiviral, antiprotozoa, whatever is antifungal, whatever is the causative organism. If it's caused by MI, then of course you treat the MI. And if it's caused by lupus, then you treat the lupus, with, which is steroids. That's your treatment during a lupus flare-up. 
Uh, but remember, no steroids if it's bacterial. Okay. So these are our dangerous life-threatening complications. Depends on the size of that pericardial effusion. Again, if, if the amount of fluid there is way more than 50, 100 already, so that will start increasing pressure around the heart. So that needs to be drained, right? Or else the patient will go into shock. Um, so this is the procedure. This will be a long uh, needle, 18 gauge needle, which the doctor will insert under your sternum um, in your uh, xiphoid process. You, you know where does where is your xiphoid process? Mr. Richard, where do you find your xiphoid processor? I can't remember right now. It's at the tip of your sternum, right? Okay. Okay, so that's your xiphoid process. So the doctor will insert the 18 gauge, it's about eight inches long. So he insert that, of course, it's not done blindly. Okay, so the doctor will need ultrasound to see where the needle is so, so that he doesn't puncture the heart. So he needs to stick that needle in to drain the fluid. So that is pericardiosynthesis. Um, however, this is a life-threatening complication of um, lupus. Once you hear um, muffled heart sounds, you have hypotension right here. Um, the clinical hallmark features of cardiac tamponade are hypotension, muffled heart sounds, and jugular vein distension. There's also pulsus paradoxus. Pulsus paradoxus is defined by, as the, the blood pressure is lower during inspiration and higher during expiration. What does that mean? Okay, so imagine this is now your heart and this is the pericardium. The pericardium is now so large because there's fluid here everywhere. It's a lot of fluid. This condition is now called cardiac tamponade. If the develop the difference between tamponade and effusion is really on the rate by which it developed. If this developed over several hours, several days, it's called pericardial effusion because the onset is not acute. If the onset is acute, meaning this developed within a few minutes, it's now called cardiac tamponade, which is an emergency. This is now a medical emergency. The doctor has to perform the emergency pericardiosynthesis. Your signs and symptoms are again muffled heart sounds. Of course, of course, all that fluid there. My drawing is only two dimensional. This is now a three. If I had the ability to do 3D, that means there's water all over here also. In front, in the back, below, on top of the heart, it's full of fluid. Okay, so that's why you have muffled heart sounds, blood pressure of, of course will drop because uh, venous return and cardiac output will be low, so hypotension. And you have jugular vein distension because uh, this is your superior vena cava, so from the patient's head, the uh, blood will be stuck here because the, the, the pressure here is so great that it will keep the blood inside the heart very hard to pump it out that's why they're also having a hard time putting blood in so of course your neck veins will be distended and then finally there is pulsus paradoxus the remember you have the lungs here so the lungs during inspiration of course when these two hyperinflate during inspiration, they will squeeze the heart, right? Because the heart is in the mediastinum. So the blood pressure drops even more during inhalation. And of course, once the 
lungs deflate, the blood pressure improves. So that's what we call pulses paradoxes. When you see these signs, of course, your number one action is to call the doctor. So for every pericarditis patient, you should monitor them for these complications, either pericardial, pericardial effusion or the more emergent complication is cardiac tamponade. Any question? These are again your hallmark features. So every pericarditis patient must be monitored for these complications. Once identified, call the physician, prepare for emergent pericardiosynthesis. If the onset is slow, of course, the doctor has the option to schedule the pericardiosynthesis, but that procedure is not an emergency. It's because again, the accumulation of the fluid was slow. We had time. This one, within a few minutes, if this occurs, because this may not only be fluid, this could also be blood. Blood can also accumulate there. So another thing we would avoid giving these patients are anticoagulants. Okay, we can give um, NSAIDs for the pain, but uh, try not to give any uh, anticoagulants because of the danger of cardiac tamponade. Any question? So here's your summary for your nursing care. So here are your signs again of cardiac tamponade. That's the most uh, dangerous complication. It's life-threatening. Uh, pain, we address the pain. Here are your positionings. So because remember, they have orthopnea already. So um, to help with that, you keep them uh, 45 degrees or higher. Here's the NSAIDs for pain. Um, if the patient is, is the cause was from lupus and they, they take steroids for it, of course, you know that, right? Uh, stopping the steroids will cause acute adrenal insufficiency, which is also life threatening. This condition will lead to hypotension, um, hypoglycemia and uh, sorry, hypokalemia. Oh, wait a minute, hyperkalemia, sorry. Acute adrenal insufficiency will have hypotension, hyperkalemia, and hypoglycemia, yeah. I will discuss adrenal insufficiency next semester. Any question on pericarditis? Miss Donna, Miss Umu. No. All right, take a break. Come back at ten forty-five.